Good evening, good afternoon. This is indeed the day that the Lord has made. We're called to rejoice and be glad in it. It's another Wednesday. We have the opportunity to go uh, explore the text, the Word of God in His Word, His breathed Word. We're able to explore the text. So we welcome you to Encouragement Temple's Bible study lesson on today. I know that you are expecting Pastor Reed. Don't worry. He's going to be here. I'm just here to give the announcements. Uh, so just please uh, be mindful of uh, the next few things. Uh, but before I give those announcements, I want you to let us know where you're joining us from. If you're joining us from another uh, location, another city, another state, just let us know where you're joining us from, how your day has been. It was a little bit rainy, so we hope that everyone is being safe. All right. So just Keep in mind a few things. Uh, we will have a worship experience. This is going to be the first Sunday in the month of May. We are almost at the halfway mark of year 2024. So we hope that you join us in worship on this Sunday at 10 a.m. And then continue to connect with us virtually for our Bible study lessons. We are virtual. We have not uh, resumed in-person Bible studies as of yet. It seems like you, know, you all are liking the virtual aspect. So we will continue to do that. We have Bible study every Wednesday at 7 o'clock p.m. Right now, we'll be exploring the book of James. And so we hope that you have your Bibles and that you're ready to dive in with us. Then also, we have given opportunities that are available at the, uh, maybe at the bottom of your screen or whichever way you're viewing this feed. Uh, but please make sure that you take advantage of those opportunities uh, via uh, PayPal or via Zelle. Utilize those opportunities and those resources because giving is an act of worship. So we hope that you will worship us or worship the Lord, excuse me, through giving toward Encouragement Temple. I believe that is all of the announcements. If you have prayer requests, please submit those in the chat so that we can pray and add you to our list, even as we're sharing it with our supporters and members of Encouragement Temple. Uh, but before we go any further, let's go ahead and pray to the Lord God on this day. And then I'm going to turn you over to the hands of Pastor Reed. Lord God, how we thank you. We love you. We adore you for this opportunity to explore the text, Father. We pray that you will uh, cover the hearts, minds, and the emotions of your people that will view on today. Father, we ask that you would um, sow seeds of growth and commitment on today as we explore James and what you have to say to us through your word. Father, forgive us for our sins on this day and meet us all at the point of our need that we will be challenged, encouraged, and that you will be edified. Lord, we love you and we thank you that you have heard us. And thank you most importantly for your son, Jesus, who is the Christ. It is in his name that we pray and ask it all. And thank you. Amen. All right, so that is my part of today. I want you to go ahead and uh, get your pens, your paper, and enjoy uh, the, the Bible study lesson on today. Uh, it's an interactive session. So I'm going to turn you over to Pastor Reed, who's excited to engage with you all on today. Pastor Reed. All right, people of God, I'm here. I'm here. Did she do a wonderful job, you all? All right, and so this week's lesson, y'all, we thank God. We finally made it through the book of Hebrews. And so now, as we continue to travel throughout our New Testament, we are now on in the book of James, the epistle of James. And so those you with us, again, as she stated, this is an interactive session, so we ask you all to leave statements, comments, feedbacks, anything that pertains to the lesson or to through things of God. And so let us take off from there. We're going to read the first verse and we're going to dive into this lesson. Again, we're in James, the first chapter. Where the Lord says, the beginning of it says, James, a bond servant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ to the 12 tribes which are scattered. And so it's amazing. We really talked about James. And who is this James? This James is the, the brother, a lot of people say half brother, but he's the brother of Jesus Christ. And he's also the brother of Jude, which we will dig into later on as Jude is towards the end of the New Testament. Now, what's amazing, what I love, he says here that he's a bond servant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ. And now what kind of stands out to me is in his introduction, you all, he calls himself a bond servant. Y'all, people will say, well, how is that important? Where, well, this individual was in a position where he could have used, right, his bloodline, being that he's the brother of Jesus Christ. He could have said, well, I'm James, 
the brother of Jesus Christ. But he understood that it was bigger than just being connected to Jesus. He, he wants everybody to know that I know that he's my brother, but that's not my role at this moment. My role is being a servant of the Lord Jesus Christ. And what he teaches us just in the introduction is that your connections doesn't matter, right? It doesn't matter if you on a, you're, you're, you're connected to the bishop or you're, you, since you are the son of the pastor that you're next in line or that your dad is the pastor, your brother holds a high position that you, you are entitled. That's the best word to use, entitled for position. Even though he, he could have said that I'm, I'm the brother of Jesus, he understood that there's no entitlement in the gospel. There's no entitlement in this walk called Christianity. And we need to make sure we have that in our psyche that there's no entitlement. Um, we can't live off of Big Mama's prayers. You can't live off your mother's prayers. You have to have a relationship for yourself. You have to understand your placement in God. Uh, pastors, preachers, apostles, um, we are all servants. And that's what I love about James. And if James was is bold enough, right, and godly enough to tell to, to, to inform himself or to classify, introduce himself as a bond servant, as a servant to the Lord and to Jesus Christ, then we as uh, preachers and teachers, evangelists, um, disciples of the gospel, that should be our title. So when they ask us before anything, before your pastor, before your preacher, you're a servant of the Lord Jesus Christ. And so he, he makes us aware that that's how we should um, introduce ourselves or carry ourselves as servants. He says to the 12 tribes that's scattered abroad, right? And so now, now, now that's important because um, this letter, right? Even though it applies to all Christians, because we're reading it today and we use the book of James as an instructional epistles and it helps us as children of God in our walk, we have to understand that in the beginning that, that James probably wrote this letter before the Gentiles was brought to the church, right? And so he, this was in the time before the Gentile Christians appeared in a great, great number. And so at this particular time, of the 12 tribes, once, once the Roman government understood and knew that they were preaching the, the, uh, the way of Christianity, it caused the people to scatter. And so that's how you get to understand where Jesus says in Acts 1 and 8, um, in, 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 in Jerusalem, Judea, and to the uttermost parts of the world. In order to get to the uttermost parts, the people had to be scattered abroad. And so James is writing to these people and he uses the customary Greek uh, greeting. He says, greeting, greetings to you all, greetings. But now we get into the meat of the epistle. He says, my brother, count it all joy when you fall into various trials, knowing that the testing or the trying of your faith produces a work at patience. But let patience have its perfect work. You may be perfect and complete, lacking Nothing. He says, count it all joy when you fall into various trials, right? And what I love here, James, what he's informing you is that he's letting us, letting us know that trials in life are inevitable, right? As long as we continue to live in a godly manner, we are going to go through trials. We're going to go through hardships. We're going to go through situations that keeps us discouraged, right? But he says in this moment, that the, these trials, even though they are tough, they are okay. They are occasions for joy. And why is that important? Because you have to understand is for us today is that people are watching us, how we handle hardships and trials and tribulations. And when people know your situation and know how things may be uncomfortable in your lives, in your life, they're watching to see, if you're going to stand firm on what you preach and teach, or are you going to crumble because life is lifing and it's hard at that moment? But he says, count it. Count it all joy. Count it all joy. Because what he's understanding is that if we don't count it all joy, then discouragement can sit in. And so when you're going through a trial or tribulations, 
uh, issues in life, our, our our approach to it will dictate how we move through it, right? So when the hardships come and we're crying, we're under the we're under a rock. We don't want to come out in the light because we're allowing it to consume us. We're not allowing it to produce joy. We're not counting it all joy as a privilege because I'm suffering for the gospel of God. No, we allowed it to handcuff us, to keep us bound. But he said, why should we count it out joy? He says, knowing that the testing of your faith produces patience, right? Produces patience. Faith is tested through trials, but faith is not produced in trials, right? What trials, what it does, it reveals what type of faith that we have, right? Because if an individual don't have the faith that God will bring them out, then they cannot and will not count it all joy. So, but what it does is that when we walk through it with joy, we're allowing faith, right, to produce patience. Um, uh, um, because the trial, let me say this, the trials that we go through, it shows us where the measure of our faith is in God. You, y'all, you know, we've been in church. We see, we see people testify big when things are well. Oh, I trust in God with everything. And the person says that when things are popping in their life, when things are going well, but your, your your faith is not tested when life is beautiful and and grand. Um, the folks, old folks used to say, you don't know God as a healer until you're sick or need him to heal you, right? You don't know him as a way maker until you need a way made. You don't know him doing tough times until the tough times hit you. You don't know him until... You're faced with those times. That's where the trials and tribulation come. He says, let it produce faith. <sighs> trials doesn't produce faith, but when trials are received with faith, it produces patience, right? Patience. What is patience? Yet patience is not inevitably produced in times of trials. Because some of us, if we've been through trials and we've been through tribulations, sometimes we try to we try to rush our way out. We try to make sure we can handle it as fast as possible. But he says, count it all joy when you go through this, because the trying of your faith it produces patience. It uh, it allows you to see that sometimes some things takes times, but you got to have the faith to endure, right? Because there's two things we can think about, right? Think about this. If difficulties are received in uh, unbelief or you're grumbling and you're complaining, right? It doesn't produce patience. What it produces is bitterness and discouragement. So it's almost how you go into it, how you handle it, right? So if I'm going through a trial and I'm, I'm going through my issues of life and I'm allowing it to produce patience, then what that is saying is I'm allowing faith to have worked. I'm walking by faith and not by sight. But if I'm allowing to go by sight, then then it, 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 it doesn't leave room to produce patience. And then when I become impatient and things are not changing the way that I think that it should, then bitterness sits in. And then that's when you begin to question and to compare your situation and other and begin to ask God, why am I going through this? And Sister Jack Lee, uh, didn't deal with their issue as long as I did or their situation is di it's differently. It's because we're entering the trials with the wrong mindset. That's why he says, count it all joy from the very jump. The beginning of your trial, you have to change your mindset. People of God, James, even though he was talking to a first century church, the word of God still applies today. When you go through the unemployment, when you go through the health issues, we have to adjust the way we enter these situations and enter them with joy, understanding that the joy of the Lord is your strength. And if the joy of the Lord is your strength and you understand that he can do the impossible, then you can walk through it realizing that God has me. And if he has me, then he will make sure that I make it up. And this is why he says kind of all joy. 
because watch this and kind of all joy is faith response to a time of trial yeah yeah Reg, you're supposed to pray but but you don't gain no you you pray for patience but when you pray for patience i'm gonna answer that that's a good that's a good statement yes you pray for patience right but the only way you're going to get that patience is god gonna send you through something to produce that patience right because you we can we can pray for patience all we want you can pray for it but you won't know what patience really is until you have to go through something and it shows you and it produces it for you it's like this i don't need patience for god to send somebody through to help me pay a bill when i have the money in the bank right if I have it, I can just go get it. I don't need patience for that. Patience come when you have no other way of coming out and you just trust in God. That's why he says, count it all joy when you go through devil's trials and tribulations, knowing that the trying of your faith or the testing of your faith produces patience. You pray for it. Lord, Lord, I need patience. Okay, God will say, okay, you need patience. Well, let me send this trial, this, this trial your, your way to teach you how to gain patience. Uh, that's why some of us, when God has done something, you went through a trial of tribulations, and then once you finally come out, then you go through something else. Your that's what produces your patience because now you have a better understanding. And so you can handle a situation differently because you, 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 you've grown, you've grown in that, pray, it, that, that trial. It produced that patience that you need in order for the next trial or tribulations. But he says, but let patience have its perfect work, right? Another translation that says, let her have her perfect work. And what it is saying is allow it to do what it's supposed to do. He says that you may be perfect and complete, lacking nothing, right? So the work of patience the, the work of patient endurance comes slowly and must be allowed to have full bloom. What do you mean, right? What do you mean full bloom? You have to allow it to completely work in your life. So you can't start off by having patience, then your patience run thin, right? And so, and so let's talk about producing. Let, let's, let's look at it like this, right? And so I've had this conversation with my oldest son. Um, he made a statement to me. He said, and it's, I'm going to connect it. He said, Dad. I said, yes. He said, you're a lot, you don't, you don't discipline as fast as you did with me. And what I showed him, I said, well, well Junior, you was the first. And so with you, it was a learning process. I had to learn. I had to learn patience. And he taught me patience. So now with these, with the kids that came after him, since I learned patience through him, I'm able to exhibit patience with these other ones. And so that's how we produce patience. That's a good way of, of, of defining patience is that the next time you go through something similar, um, you've learned patience through the first trial, through the first issue. So Throughout, you're able to rest and trust in God and count it all joy because you have an experience. That's the word. Yeah, I like that, Pastor Chris, because you have an experience now that that I've made it through. And so since I made it through through my experience, I know that God is more than a capable and able to do what he says and bring me out. Amen. All right. And so um, verse 5 through 8 says, If any of you lack wisdom, let him ask of God who gives to all liberally and without reproach and it will be given to him. But let him ask in faith with no doubting for he who doubts is like a wave of the sea driven tossed by the wind and let no, let not the man suppose that he will receive anything from the Lord. He is a double minded man, unstable in all of his ways, right? So let's look at that. He says, if any man lacks wisdom, because certain trials bring a, ne a necessary reason, right? Uh, it brings the season, a reason and a season. I'm going to use that like that for us to seek wisdom from God. Because there are some things that we naturally can't produce on our own. We just, 
are not able to handle. We don't have the knowledge and the understanding and the wisdom. And so he says, ask God for wisdom because we often don't need wisdom until we're faced with a difficult time or a difficult decision to make. And that's when we have to seek God. God, I need you. God, I need you to, 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 to work on my mind. Give me a sign. Show me, God, which way to go. God, I need your wisdom in this situation. He said, who gives to all liberally and without reproach? Because if you ask God, God will give it to you. You have not because you ask not. You're like, how come you was able to use wisdom in this situation? Well, because I asked God for it. I asked God for it. And if you're going to ask him, then ask of him. He says, let him ask God. We just have to simply ask. That's what I love about, about children, right? Because you feel like, we feel like sometimes we shouldn't ask. But one thing I learned about children, children will ask and then they will keep asking. They will keep asking until you finally say, here, you can have it. And so that's the time we need to have the mind of a child. Keep asking God, God, I need your wisdom. God, I need more wisdom. God, give me more wisdom. God, I need more wisdom. Because we have to understand is that our natural mind, we don't understand trials and tribulations and things of God, so we have to seek him, right? And he said, if you ask, it will be given to him. He said, but let him ask in faith with no doubting. And I think that's the biggest thing with us is that when we ask God for things, sometimes in the back of our mind and our conscience, we tend to doubt as, as if God will really give it to us, right? And so we, he says, ask him. Let him ask in faith. So asking God shows dependency. There's a difference between knowledge and wisdom. Yeah, and we'll get on that anyway, because you could be knowledgeable and don't have the wisdom to be able to, to articulate or move through certain things. Um, he says, let him ask in faith, in faith. Our request for wisdom must be made like every other thing that we ask of God. In faith, everything. Is by faith, in faith, without faith, as we learned in Hebrews, it's impossible to please God. So with every decision, we have to ask in that not, in that notion. He says, with no doubting. In other words, believing once I ask God that he's going to give it to me, not if or maybe or he might, that he will, right? Because he said, for he who doubts is like a wave or sea driven, tossed by the wind. What he's saying is the one who doubts and lacks faith should not expect to receive anything from God because at this moment what you're doing is you're not trusting that God will do what he said he's going to do he says for let not that man suppose that he will receive anything from the Lord he is a double minded man unstable in all his ways and so what do you mean a double minded person that means you're 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 talking you're going back and forth you're going back and forth you're you you oh he gonna do it oh he not he said and, and, and that person is unstable Right? It's like if somebody asks you to do something and you're like, um, I don't know, maybe you should do this, maybe we should do that. A person will look at you and say, you are unstable, right? And that's the thing is that if we, if, if, if we don't have faith, we, then, then, then why ask for the impossible if we don't have the faith to believe that he's going to answer us? And so, and so he, he's, he's informing these Christians that these, that, that scattered abroad, Look, y'all entering new territory, whatever you need, you ask, believing that he's going to do it. Because what to be, because what he's saying is to be in the middle ground between faith and unbelief, right? That's where you are. You in that middle between faith and unbelief. It's like you're right there and you, you it's like a tug of war in your spirit. I want to believe, but then I don't. I want to believe, but I can't. I want to do this, but I don't know. That's, um, that's a, that's a double-minded person. Double-minded person can be persuaded anyway. You're not stable. There's no solid foundation under your feet. Mm. All right, verses 9 through 11. Verses 9 through 11, he says, Let the lowly brother glory in his exaltation, but the rich in his humiliation, because as a flower of the field, of the field, he will pass away. For no sooner has the sun risen with a burning heat than it withers the grass. Its flowers fails, and its beautiful appearance perishes. So the rich man also will fade away in his pursuits. He says, let the lowly brother give, give, let the lowly brother glory in his exaltation, right? Ah, he is saying at this moment, be humble. 
be humble. Because in, in the humble spirit, the humble will be exalted. And so he says, let the lowly person, the person of a low countenance, the person of a low spirit, right? He says, let him rejoice when they are lifted by God. Because you're understanding that I, I, I'm, I'm taking a position of lowliness. I'm not in this position of being high and mighty, right? So because a lot of us, when trials and tribulations come, we want to put this facade on like everything is okay and I'm blessed and highly favored. I, the Lord is great. And you may be blessed and highly favored, but at the same time, hey, be real. Lord, I'm going through, sick and tired of being sick and tired. But I'm take the Lord, Lord I'm just going to trust in you. And then when God exalts you, right, rejoice. He also says, but the rich in his humil humiliation, because as the flower of the field, he will pass away. What he's saying is for the rich to rejoice when they are brought to humiliation by trials. <sighs> because what he's saying is now your ego has been broken down, your pride has been destroyed, has been knocked down. He he says rejoice in your humiliation. And a lot of us we can attest or we can we 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 can relate to a point where everything was going well in our lives. Financially we were doing well, uh, uh career wise, family wise, but then everything took a toll and it hit rock bottom. And he is telling that individual, because when that happens, the 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 natural human thing for us to do it's a hide in the corner, feel sad, cry about everything because we feel like as if once we lost it all that we have no value. But he says rejoice. Why are you rejoicing that? Because you, you have a greater understanding, right? That God is your sustainer. Yes, I could lose it all. But in the midst of it, I thank God anyway that even by him allowing us to do this, he can still allow me to go through my hardship, throughout my pain. He says what? Because in this high mighty, he said, because as flowers of the field, he will pass away. Why? Because the trials serve to remind the rich and the high that they, uh, that though they are comfortable in life, it is still only life, right? And since it's only life, we understand that, that these things will fade away like grass. It will burn out. It will fade away. And, and he, it teaches us to don't put a lot of stock in materialism. And I get it when, it, and it's amazing that he, that, that James wrote this in the first century church. And we look at today, the same thing still applies today. We like to put our trust, we like to put our all in all in materialistic things, right? In the houses that we live in, the cars that we drive, the clothes that we wear. Think about this, y'all. We're in prom season, right? Let's, look, let's think about this. We're in prom season. If you look at all the pictures, the things of social media that, that, that's been taken, it is all about materialism. Oh, I want my child to have the biggest prom. Uh, we're going to do the greatest prom send-off. And not nothing against prom send-offs. Let me say that now. Nothing against it. But as a child of God, what are you doing all of that for? Are you doing it for the child? Are you doing it for the likes and look or to show people I can do this? In the day, what we're doing is we're doing things for the wrong reason. Right? You spend all this money for the prom sent off only to have to come back and be broke. I wonder how you're going to pay this light bill, but you just spent three, four thousand dollars on a send off, fifteen hundred dollars on a prom sent off. Like what, what, what are we accomplishing here? He said all those things will pass away. I, I don't know why I got on this soap, soap box about prom sends off, but it applies here. Th that will pass away in a week that will be forgotten about. But you still have to listen. What are your motives behind these? Hmm. Okay. Verse 12. Again, this interactive. So those of you who are viewing us online, give us your comments, your questions, your feedbacks. He says here, verse 12. Blessed is the man who endures temptation. For when he has been approved, right, he will receive the crown of life, which the Lord has promised to those who love him. Blessed is the man who endures temptations um he says is it what's this he says watch this as we preserve as we persevere through temptations we are approved and will and will be rewarded as the work of god in us is evident through our resistance of temptations so what is he saying at that moment what 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 james is informing us informing us is that temptation will arise 
but we got to have enough fortitude, enough godliness in us to be able to endure, to press through the temptation, to press through falling to the things. Now, let me talk, what is temptation? Temptation is that thing that can lure you away that your flesh desires, right? And so, uh, an example, if, if your temptation is, um, give this the one out there, alcohol, which is you alcohol, right? You're not going to be tempted with gambling because you don't gamble. Gambling is not a thing for you. Temptation is, is that thing that the flesh desires. And that is against God's will. Let, let me make that straight. And against God's will, right? So if, if your thing is getting drunk, alcoholism, and you're, and you're drifting away and God has delivered you from that, then the enemy is going to allow alcoholism to come in your place somewhere, in your circle somewhere, to tempt you. But James is telling these individuals, blessed is this individual who endures it, who makes it through, who does not succumb through the temptation. He said, because in doing so, right, you're going to receive the crown of life which the Lord has promised, which tells me what James is reminding us is that right, that it is really worth it to endure these temptations we face. It is important because in doing so, we are going to receive a, 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 a heavenly reward. And that is, and how do you resist the temptations? Well, you resist it by constantly being in your word, getting closer with Jesus Christ, right? And so that's what it is, your steadfastness. Mm, will be rewarded, right? As we demonstrate our, our self-reliance on Jesus to help us make it through. And that shows the love that we have for Jesus by, by resisting, by enduring, by not falling or succumbing to the things of the world that tempts us for doing wrong. Amen, amen. Again, we transition to verse, watch it, watch it, watch it, watch it. Verse 13, verse 13 through 16. Let it, he says, let no one say when he is tempted, I am tempted, tempted by God. For God cannot be tempted by evil, nor does he himself tempt anyone. But each one is tempted when he is drawn away by his own, see, his own desires and enticed. Then when desire has conceived, it gives birth to sin. And sin, when it is full grown, brings forth death. Do not be deceived, my beloved brethren. Hmm. He says, he says, let no one say when he is tempted, he is tempted of God. Because temptation does not come from God. God, he, now, now, he allows it, right? He allows it to happen. But he himself does not entice us to do evil. You think about Job and everything that Job went through. God did not bring the, the evil. He did not bring the temptation, but he allowed Satan. He allowed the enemy to tempt and test Job to show Job that he, that, that to show that Job is righteous as he said it is. I'm saying all that to say God does not tempt you. God does not bring evil your way, right? It is, but he allows it. But he explains it here that each one is tempted when he's drawn away by his own desires and enticed. That's why I said when I stated earlier, right, that temptation comes when we are drawn away by our own fleshly lust. Um, that thing that the flesh likes, right? The thing that makes you crawl, that makes you feel good naturally. And, is, and let me say this, and it's not of God. We have to make that make that be known. And it's not of God. He says that's when it's actually produced is when you are committed. That's why he says that that right here. Then when desire has conceived, when you have fallen prey to your desire, when you have given in to the temptation, he said it gives birth to sin. As long as there's a temptation and it is there, it is not sin. It's not a a sin until 
you 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 act on your these desires until you really go forth and doing it right so if i'll just use this as an example um if if the money is there for you to steal, let's look at that. Because let's just say a person, they, 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 their, their thing is money, right? And you know this, this is, you, you, you know, I'm gonna put this on the side. You have bills that's due, right? You're unemployed, but then you know such and such has money right here, uh, ten thousand dollars, right? The desire is there. As long as it's there and you're not touching it, it's a desire, but you're not falling prey to that desire. It becomes a sin once you act on it and take that money and hide it and act like you had to, you don't have it because what, what you've just done is you stolen that money. And so that's why he says here, when desire has conceived, it gives birth to sin. And sin, when it is full grown, brings forth death. That's why he said the wages of sin is death. If you allow and you continue to live a lifestyle of sin, what happens is if you die in your sin, then there's a spiritual death that you will have to deal with in the afterlife. And so he says here, endure it. If you endure it, then he says, then you will receive a crown of life. But if you don't endure it, then what is going to happen is it's going to birth sin. And sin, once it becomes full grown or, or, or really resonates and grow within, it, it, it will it will bring forth death. And so he tells the people of God, do not be deceived, my beloved brother. And that's the word that we say, don't be deceived. Uh, don't allow your fleshly desires to overtake or to, oh, to overrule the spirit of God. That's why we fast. That's why we pray. That's why we, we, we get closer to God. So that way we have the, the strength we're able to, 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 to stand firm, count it all joy, and to endure temptation. We're able to endure it because we have what we need on the inside of us to give us the strength to persevere and to make it through it. Amen. Because when he said, don't be deceived, we got to remember before I move forward is that he says this, Satan only comes to kill, steal, and destroy. And so once we understand that, we understand it's a process, steal, kill and destroy. He wants to destroy your witness. He wants to kill you. He wants to kill you spiritually, mentally, but we have to be able to be in a place that we recognize that. Mm, all right, people of God, let's look at verses 17 and 18. He says, for every good and every perfect gift is from above, comes down from the father of lights, with whom there is no variation or shadow of turning. Of his own will, he brought us forth by the word of truth that we might be a kind of first fruit of his creatures. Mm. He says every good and every perfect gift, right? Every good gift, and every perfect gift comes from above because in our flesh, we can't expect nothing uh, uh naturally good to come out of. Um, and so there's no true goodness in our flesh. Like if a person does something for you, uh, some, most people have an arterial motive behind what they do, right? If they're not led by God or the spirit of God is not in them. Um, yeah, I do this for you, but you're expecting something else in return. That's human nature. But when God gives you something, it is a gift not get looking for anything. It is with not wishy-washy. He's not an Indian giver. So whenever he gives you good and every good and, and perfect gift comes from above and says with him, there's no variation or shadow of turning. Uh, other words, what that, all of that is saying in the soul in a nutshell is God is consistent in his character. And that's something that humanity that we're not, we're not consistent in our character. Uh, some people and I, you, you, we've probably worked on jobs, right? Where we've seen people bring their trials and tribulations to work, and they act differently. They wish you watch it because human nature, humanly, we're not consistent. Some of us, without the Spirit of God, we don't know how to handle the trials and tribulations in our lives in a godly manner. Um, 
And so we allow the things of this world. We allow the cares of this world. We're, we allow in today's society, uh, social media to dictate how we should act or how we should move. Uh, some of y'all, if you can attest or you can testify to the fact that sometimes you've allowed what you see people do on social media make you act a certain way because you feel like you should be doing that. Um, and sometimes on these social media posts, I gotta, you know, do like, oh, they hugged up with their boo, my boo's like that, 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 nothing but a picture, right? Not understanding, you don't know what they're going through outside of the social media snaps. They doing that to get the likes. You don't know what's happening behind closed doors. And so, but anyway, but he says, God is consistent. And that's what I love. And I, I'm grateful that God is not like man. We say that all the time, but the reality is God is not like us. He's a constant God. He's consistent in his character. He's, he's, he's infallible. What you mean infallible? He, he's, he's unchangeable. He doesn't change. He is who he is. He says, of his own will, he brought us forth by the word of God. And what James was telling us, right, is that he understood that the gift of salvation, right, by the word of God was given to us by God. And it was something that we couldn't earn by work or obedient or something of obedience, right? It couldn't, it's uh, what he's saying. Is, this is something we couldn't earn on our own. It, it was a gift to us. He says that we might be a kind of first fruits of his creatures. And what he is saying is we can see God goodness in our salvation, right? Because what he did is he initiated our salvation of his will and brought us forth to a spiritual life by the word of God or by the word of truth. Right, that he might be glorified, or that he might be the glory of the first fruits of his harvest, which is in us. And so, when you hear that, that we might be the kind of first, fruits, we are we are commissioned, right, to be that first fruit, to make sure that we are that light, that we're doing what we're doing and putting him first in everything that we do. And so, how do you do that? Okay, in the morning, the first thing we should do every morning. Is thank God every morning. God, thank you. And we don't do that. No, we, we don't do that every morning. Sometimes we just get up and go, right? But we don't acknowledge him. We don't acknowledge him with our time, with our gifts, with our financial submit. God allowed you to, to be in positions that we are in, but we take it for granted. And so we're not, we don't always exhibit the fact that, you know, we, 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 we can be a kind of first fruits because we 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 take it for granted and feel like things that we have and we're in positions that we are in because we have the right connections because we've done everything right. But the reality is, the Bible says no man no man can live. I'm paraphrasing, but no man on this earth can say that he 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 is sinless. I'm paraphrasing this, y'all. This is in Romans. We talked about this a while ago, and so it behooves us that every morning that we wake up, first thing we need to do. Is, is giving the first fruit of our praise. Now, I'm not saying you got to be there 30 minutes. That's you. That's you. Get up, Lord. Thank you for keeping it. Lord, allow me for waking me up. Start me on my day. Then do what you have to do. All right. Mm, verses 19 and 20. He says, so then, my brother and my, my beloved brother, let every man be swift to hear, slow to speak, and slow to wrath. For the wrath of man does not produce the righteousness of God. Let every man be swift to hear. Right. And so much of our anger and wrath comes from being self-centered and not other centered. Right. Let's think about that. When we are quick to speak, when we speak fast and we are angry. Right. What we're saying at that moment, it's all about me. I'm not worried about your feelings. You're not worried about mine. It's all about me. And I'm not other centered. That's why he said at this moment, be swift to hear. Don't, when we're listening, don't listen just to fire off real quick. That's, that goes against everything that we've been taught. We've been taught, no, let nobody get the best of you. Don't let them talk to you crazy. And we always bark back, right? And the situation is escalated because we're going back. But he said, be swift to hear. Listen first. Listen first, right? Because when we listen first, what we're saying is, is that we're, 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 we're being other centered. In other words, we're, we're thinking about the person that's speaking to us. And so we have to be mindful of that. Not always, 
speaking quick. He said, but be slow to speak. It's amazing. He wanted you to hear and then be slow to speak. Don't be, don't be so fast to say something that you miss or you don't process what was being said. And a lot of arguments, right, can be, could be eliminated if we listen. If we listen, and not just listen, y'all, but don't interrupt that other person while they're talking. And that's a big thing in, in the heated conversation. Somebody has to be the bigger person, right, to to say, you know what, I'm going to listen. I'm going to keep quiet. I'm a process. That's right, Pastor Chris, you've been listening to me. Active listen, not quick to interrupt. And that's what we do because when you're in a heated argument, it's two individuals that want to prove their point. I want to prove who their right and prove their stance. But sometimes if we're quiet, if we're not entertaining, we're listening and we're processing, then you realize both stance are, are, are applicable and you can come up to a resolution. Hmm. But he's also saying, not only be, he said, be slow to speak, but be slow to wrath. Slow to wrath. In other words, another word for wrath is angry. Be slow to get angry. He is saying exhibit some emotional stability. Right? Some emotional stability. When we're quick and we get angry fast, what we're saying is we are emotionally unstable. But when we're slow to anger, what we're doing is we are uh, processing some things, listening and thinking about what that other person has said. And maybe what they're saying could help me along the way. But if we're so quick to speak, and when we speak and we are angry, we're not processing anything that anybody has to say. say listen, to the fir listen first to understand what the other is saying as opposed to always wanting to be understood. Yeah, that's what we're saying. Process what they are saying. Yes. He says, says, for the wrath of man does not produce the righteousness of God. Our wrath, our anger does not accomplish righteousness. It doesn't accomplish uh, uh, godliness. What it does, it, 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 what it does, it basically, it defends and, and promotes our own agendas and feelings. Right? And so, what he is saying is, one of the things that you can tell that you're growing in his grace, that you're growing in grace, that you're growing in God, is how you handle conflicts. How you handle conflicts. And if you're, I'm okay, husband and wife. Let's talk about husband and wives for a minute. You know, let's just say the husband and wife, y'all get into a heated argument. In the past, both of you always, both of you always spaz out, wah, wah, wah. But you see, emotional growth when one person is speaking and you're actively listening to that person and you're actually allowing the process and you're moving you can say did you begin to see that you know what I'm allowing God to do something because what he's saying is go against everything that the flesh says because the flesh wants you to speak quick the flesh wants you to get some to get angry and he's saying suppress that flesh. That's what James is saying in so many words. Suppress the desire of wanting to get angry. Suppress that desire because once you get angry, then there's no godliness that's being led in you. It's, godliness is not steering you. Fleshness is steering you. And so and you're what you're doing is you're pushing your own agenda and your own anger because you want everybody to know how you feel. And so be it. Okay, verse 21. Therefore, lay aside all filthiness and overflow of wickedness and receive with meekness the Im implanted word, which is able to save your souls, right? And basically what he says, uh, all filthiness and overflow, this, this is talking about an individual with, with an impure manner of living, right? He's saying, don't, don't do that. Therefore, lay aside all filthiness. In other words, if you're living ratchetly, that ratchet life, throw it to the side. Transition your living. He said, put that to the side and receive with meekness the implanted word. Receive with meekness, with joy. Be teachable. Be open-minded. Receive it in the spirit of, of humbleness. 
the implanted word, the word of God, right? Because the word of God is the thing that's able to save our souls, right? And what it does, the watch this, right? The, the, the purity of God's word, what it is able to do, it, it can it can preserve us, right? In, a, in an impure age. Think about the society that we're in. It's all about self-sufficiency. It's all about self-promotion. But the word of God will will help us in the spirit of God will guide us and show us that, you know what? I can live godly in the midst of a society that doesn't promote the things of God. He said, that's why, and I don't want to go too far, but we're, we're, we're in the world, but we don't have to be of the world, right? And so that's when we receive with meekness the word of God, understanding that. That's why he said in the beginning to the rich man, when he said, look, this material stuff, you can put all that, that's going to pass away. That's, that's going to be passed away. You have to understand that. All right, verses 22 through 25. He says, but be doers of the words, and not hearers only, deceiving, your, deceiving yourselves. For if anyone is a hearer of the word and not a doer, he is like a man observing his natural face in a mirror. For he observes himself. Goes away and meet and immediately forgets what kind of man he was and basically forgets what he looked like. But he who looks into the perfect law of liberty and continues in it is not a forgetful hero, but a doer of the word. This one will be blessed in what he does. My God, my God. But be doers of the word and not hearers only. Um it, you, we've known people who can hear the word of God and they use the word of God for their defense and they're not really trying to be a doer of the words. They, they individual, they hear the words and then they go back, that person ain't living godly. But what are you doing when you hear the word? Are you applying it? That's why he says, don't just be hearers of the word, right? Don't just come to church and hear the word, but then when you leave, it doesn't resonate. You just come in out of tradition. No, he says, but be doers. Do what you do, what you hear. Apply the word to your life, right? And he said to take comfort in the fact that you've heard God's words, right? And what and, 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 and not only that, but you're doing it so that way you're not deceived. Because what you what what you're doing is 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 that you 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 you're not allowing the word of God to to resonate in you, and it's not growing root in you. And so what happens is is that 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 you 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 you're you're on sand, right? And if something blows, since you're not a doer of the word, it can drift and blow you. And I don't want to go too far because I know that's coming up. But anyway, you have you there's no stability in you. So he says here, yeah, he says, be doers and not hearers only. He said because if if that's the case, he says you're like a man observing observing his natural face in a mirror for. He observes himself, goes away in the media, forgets what kind of man he is. What he's saying is this is a person who looks in the mirror, sees himself, but when he goes, he doesn't remember what he looks like. He doesn't remember how his habits look. He doesn't remember what he sees in the mirror. He's saying that you're just doing it to do something. It's not It's not important. It's not resonating with you. You're just doing it out of routine. You're just doing it. Oh, okay, I look in the mirror and go about your business. Okay, well, then what is this about? Oh, I didn't see no spot. That's because you're not paying attention. You're not focused. You're not allowing the mirror to do what it's supposed to do. What is the mirror supposed to do? Well, you look in the mirror, you make sure that your shirts fit right, that your ties right, that everything is lined up. You know, he said, no, you're not doing that. That's what you are when you don't allow the word of God to resonate in you. You're hearing it, but you're not allowing it to do what it's supposed to do. You're not allowing it to, 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 to be on the inside. You're not being a doer of it. You're not allowing it to change your life, to rearrange you, to fix you. No. He said, but he who looks into the perfect law of liberty and continues it, this one will be blessed in what he does, right? Basically saying, if you study the word intently and do it, then you will be blessed. That means don't just get into your word on Wednesday night and then and then you read your scripture on Sunday morning. No, you, you have to constantly be in the word of God, right? And so, prime example, right? So we, you all know that we're in the book of James. And so you know that next week we'll be in James chapter 2. And so to be ready for Bible study next week, read James chapter 2. So that way when we come for Bible study, Lord's willing, next week, 
then you've done your digging, you've done your reading, and you have, you're ready with your questions, you're ready to really interact, because why? Because you've been reading the Word of God intently. You, 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 you're doing it with a purpose. You're not just being a hearer of the word, but you're doing it. You just be, you being a doer as well. You, you're allowing it to resonate. And you're saying to myself, how can I be a better child of God? Now, since I've read what the word of God has to say to me. My God. All right. Verse 26 and 27, y'all. We, we made it through. He says, if anyone among you think he, he is religious and does not bridle his tongue, but, but deceives his own heart, this one's religion is useless. Pure and undefiled religion before God and the Father is this, to visit the orphans and widows in their trouble and to keep oneself unspotted from the world. If anyone thinks that he is religious, right? What he is saying in so many instances, what James is saying is that if an individual who is religious, it is not, he's not just being a hearer of the word. This individual is also doing it. He's living it, right? It's, it's a part of him. It is who he is. He says, if, if he thinks he's religious and does not bridle his tongue, he deceives his own heart. What do you mean bridle his tongue? In other words, watching what you're saying, right? And, 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 and one way to do God's word is to be careful with what you speak. Don't talk bad to people. When you see people, that speak life. Speak godliness. Speak encouragement. Speak the things and the oracles of God. He said if, if, if he thinks it's a pure religion, but he's always gossiping. He always talking bad to people. He always got something negative to say. He's saying, man, your religion is useless. That's why, man, that's why some people don't come to church. Let, let's be real. Because they've seen some people who thought they was religious, but then when they see them away, they see that person when they're away from the church, they're cussing, they're talking bad about people and all this. And then people saying, why well, I'm going to live for God when Sister Bolek, I'm not coming out. She don't act like, she don't like this. this is how she act, this is how godly people talk. No, that's because she thinks that person is religious, but they haven't brightened their tongue. They haven't allowed the word of God to, 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 to manifest in their lives. And so they're, they're just hearers, they're not doers of the word. And so your religion is your religiousness is useless because what it's not doing is not bringing forth you. You cannot make disciples because what you're doing is you're showing the world that you are not stable in who you are. Wow. He says, pure and undefiled religion before God and the Father is this. He says, to visit the orphans and the widows in their troubles and to keep oneself unspotted for What he's saying is, what he's saying is a real walk with God shows itself simply as a person that practices what they preach, right? Practice what they preach. What do you mean practice what they preach? Uh, well, you, you, if I had two Christians and you both of them say I'm Christian, right? But then you got this one individual, as we talked about earlier, they're always, they always cussing folk out. They're always gossiping. Always talking about folks. Then you'll question, oh, I don't know, this person is doing bad. But then you have this other individual, right? This other individual, uh, they brighten their tongue. They're always serving. They're always helping. They're always checking on people. They're always praying. He said, this is pure religion. You, you're you more concerned about others than you are yourself. You're not gossiping with people. You, you're presenting the gospel to people. He says, this is true religion and to keep oneself unspotted from the world. Let people talk, but don't let them have facts, right? And so, and when one talks about you and not a Christian, allow your work to show. Allow them to see you feeding the hunger. Allow them to see you praying for people. Allow you to allow them to see you uh, uh, living a godly life. Uh, let them see you post on your social media page uh, things of God and not you always turning up. And so James says a lot in this first chapter, in this introduction chapter, y'all. And so that'll conclude James chapter one. Again, for those of you viewing online, we thank God for you all. Um, give y'all some quick announcements. Those you desire to give to Encouragement Temple, uh, electronically, we do have two ways that you give. You can give uh, via 
PayPal and Zelle. Uh, those given opportunities are connected to the feed. Uh, just real quick announcements, you all. Um, we're here every Wednesday night virtually at 7 p.m. Uh, we're constantly going through the New Testament. We're right now in the book of James. And so next week, Lord's willing, we'll be in James chapter 2. Uh, Sunday morning worship opportunities are set, uh, Sunday mornings at 10 a.m. Uh, we're virtual. Uh, we do uh, Follow us on our social media page. Follow us on Facebook. Uh, if you have YouTube, go and subscribe to our YouTube page and like and connect with us also on Instagram. Um, we are those way that way on Instagram. You're all aware of everything that's happening in Encouragement Temple. You have our announcement and things of that nature. I do believe those are all our announcements. If you have any prayer requests, we ask y'all to submit them in at this moment. Um, give a few seconds uh, to for those who want to submit prayer requests to submit them, and we can pray the blessings of God and to pray over you as we dismiss. Um, and so we thank God for all of you. Tune in next week for Bible study. Again, as we stated earlier, should you all know that we're in James chapter 2? Read ahead so that way when you connect with us next week, you'll be able to dig and interact with us in the word of God. All right. And so let us pray over the gifts that will be received today in this offering. And any prayer prayer requests that, are, that will come through in the chat, we'll do our best to respond and pray for your situation as well. Let us pray. Oh, Lord of God, we come before you, Father. We thank you, Father, for all that you've done for us, God. We thank you, God, that you are a provider. God, thank you that you've given us, God, gifts that we can give unto your kingdom, Father. And God, we ask you, God, for those who are given to encouragement temple, Father, we ask you to bless them, God, for those who have desired, God, but unable to give, Father, we ask you to bless them with gainful employment that they may give unto the kingdom, Father. And Father, for those who are given, Father, we ask you to bless them, God, bless them 30, bless them 60, bless them 100 fold. And Father, for any individual, God, that has a prayer request, God, those who have a request and and don't does not want to put it in the chat, Father, we ask you in the name of Jesus, according to your will, Father, that you you answer their prayers, God, that you deliver, God, that you heal, you set free, Father. And Father, we know that, God, that you can do anything but fail, God, because your word say nothing is impossible for you. And so, Father, we ask in faith, God, as your word tells us, we ask in faith, like everything else, believe in God that you will hear our prayer, that you will answer. And Father, we bless and we thank you right now. In the mighty name of Jesus Christ, we say amen and praise God. Amen, y'all. That's it. This is Pastor Reed. I'm about to sign off. Again, those of you who are in the city of Houston, come visit us, 4714 FM 1960 West, Suite 103, Houston, Texas, 77069. We would love to see you in person worship that we can hug and love on you. You could be in the atmosphere of worship and the spirit of God and the word of God will go forth. Until then, we'll see you next week. Uh, we'll see you for, for worship on Sunday. Be encouraged. Peace.